Hare Krishna Anatta Prabhu. Thank you very much for joining today. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you. Since the time I attended your communication seminar, I have appreciated the breadth and the depth of your Krishna consciousness. Breadth in terms of how you once told me when you interact with people from other faiths, you, you, you appreciate how God is acting in different people's lives. So that breadth of your Krishna consciousness as well as a depth in terms of how deeply introspective and humble you are. I remember once you told me that you feel very happy apologizing to others, to devotees for offenses that may have been committed even by other people, not you. So, you know, so I feel that you are the you are the ideal person for communications and the community, you are the communications minister, minister for our movement. So when I heard your first communications class, it is the first time I thought of this, that we might interact with people not for the purpose of preaching specifically, but just getting to know each other. So I thought we could take that as a topic today, that how can devotees engage with the world without necessarily a from a negative terminology first, from a conversion perspective. So should devotees engage? And what are the ways in which we should engage? So maybe if you can start with how you got involved with communication and what was its purpose, then we can take it forward from there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, my base is unto you and all the devotees that uh, We'll be listening to this. I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. This is a very important topic. It's one that's very uh, dear to me. And I think uh, having an opportunity to discuss with you, because you're someone who I admire, who is very much uh, trying to understand how to reach out to a, a, a vast variety of people through your different lectures and your podcasts and your books, trying to understand how to bring Krishna consciousness into people's lives. And uh, it reminds me, Right now, I'm, I'm rereading the Srila Prabhupada and Leelam Rita. I've read it, I don't know, eight, ten times, perhaps. And I just reread, I just read volume one, and then I finished and I read it all over again. I wanted to read it twice to really kind of meditate on Prabhupada's Leela. And then I'm reading right now volume two. And one thing that very much strikes me in the context of what we're talking about now is how Prabhupada was so flexible and so intent in trying anything and everything to introduce Krishna consciousness to people. Maybe we can talk about it a little bit later. But I just read, I just read yesterday how in the early days, before he even had his, his place on 26 Second Avenue, he started a Sanskrit class because some of the young people that were coming were interested in Sanskrit. So Prabhupada found a, a little blackboard somewhere in this loft where he was staying and started teaching them the Sanskrit alphabet because he knew that this is the way they were attracted to Krishna. So that, that just that flexibility is an example that I think is there for all of us. And we can talk about different different perspectives and angles on that as well. So I'm very honored to be here. I will mention one thing because we happen to be recording this just a couple of days after the passing of His Holiness Bhakti True Maharaj. And I think it's 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 appropriate that we talk about this at this time because we know Bhakti True Maharaj was such a gentleman and that everyone that he interacted with appreciated his qualities as a very nice, friendly, soft-hearted, and saintly person. And he interacted with people in the movie business, and he interacted with government leaders, and he interacted with so many important industrialists and people like that. And, uh, of course, not all of them were devotees. And he was always trying to give people Christian consciousness, but he's such a wonderful example of being able to interact with different types of people at different times. And, and always maintaining his own his own saintly demeanor, but never leaving people with any kind of feeling that he's better than someone else, which of course puts a tremendous block in any kind of relationship. So I want to you know, maybe dedicate our conversation to him and our and our remembrance of him, and and yes. and our prayers. Presence will continue uh, in Iskon for 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 many many years and generations as a wonderful saintly example of of Krishna consciousness and especially dedication to one's guru. He was uh, so dedicated to Srila Prabhupada. Amazing, yes. And you know, taking this theme of uh, Leela Amrita, you know, he engaged with the video world at a time when nowadays everybody is doing videos. 
but at that time practically nobody was doing it so he was a pioneer in that and he, he tried to bring the ilam to life that's a beautiful example yes very true yes. and there's another, an example of engaging and utilizing what's there in the world and we have so many examples shila bhakti sadanta saraswati takur and his elaborate cars and prabhupad flying in airplanes and and so every generation we have to reassess how to engage all of the energies of the lord in his service and and not be stereotyped into thinking well that's that's what was allowed 50 years ago and we can't apply it to whatever exists today it's very much as principle oriented and not get hung up in the details yes i also like one word you used you didn't use the word make people krishna conscious it is give people krishna consciousness it's a subtle but significant difference in usage it is really not we are making we are not trying to in a sense convert we are trying to enrich isn't yes. it it's a, it's a very and, and awaken awaken i think that's something our philosophy has very different from some of the other theistic philosophies which is we on the basis of a very deep philosophical analysis understand that every soul is eternally krishna conscious we're just temporarily covered over so when we're engaging people or introducing krishna consciousness it's not like you know philosophies have this idea you're lost and and then and then uh, and and then other oh, bring you more light that's good we should maybe mention the people that are watching yeah. you have a bit of a power yeah. short so you've been working with very limited light so now they're bringing more light okay it's so actually i am in govardhan eco village where today the power is not there so we are just trying to add some power i'm just using the mobile battery mm. that's good that's much better is this better so, Yeah it's a little yeah right there I think is good. It was a little yeah right there is good. Okay. Yeah. So um yes. Thank you. So we can continue. <laughs> yes ma'am. Thank you very much. Yes. So thank you ji. Yeah. Just like now you're in Eco Village so there's so many wonderful things about the eco village and so many people are coming from all around the world to go over to eco village to see a practical application and at the same time uh, when the power goes out you have to do what you can do according yeah. to <laughs> yeah. so this point you're mentioning about awakening as compared to other theistic philosophies Yes. What was the point? I'm sorry, I didn't get it. I mean, our, our philosophy: we understand every living being has an eternal relationship with Krishna. So it's not this idea that I'm connected to Krishna; they're unconnected, and I'm like some special person who's going to give them something. No, they already have it. They have a relationship with Krishna. You know, I mean, and I don't know what the rasa is of other living entities. I mean, maybe there's somebody who's whatever. You know. <laughs> in a parental rasa with krishna maybe i'm a, i'm a humble blade of grass when i go back to the spiritual sky who knows so in in i i can't i can't prejudge people or think because they've temporarily forgotten krishna i'm so special what special is that i've been given the mercy for, by my guru and the previous acharyas to assist them in helping people reawaken what they already have prabhu said that, i think when he came to europe or america that i think it was britain they asked him why have you come he said i've come to help you remember what you've forgotten Mm. which is uh, which is uh it's 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 beautiful it's beautiful it's it's humble it's beautiful and it's and it's the truth according to our vaishnav teachings yeah and if we remember everyone's a devotee of krishna then it takes down so many barriers you know that it's 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 not so much you know a thing of like okay we're vaishnava and they're a muslim or they're a jew or they're a christian and they're a jain but no we're all devotees of krishna so we all have a devotional relation with god or i'm black he's brown he's white this is a woman this is a man i mean that's our basic teaching we're not the body we're mm -hmm. all connected to krishna and it's not just that we're not the body prabhu would say that's the preliminary thing i'm not the body the next is i'm spirit soul and next is i'm an eternal servant of krishna related to him yes. as is what else You know people these days are struggling. I don't know if you hear it much in India these days, but a few years ago in the in the in the United States, a lot of talk about living holistically. Yes. How do we all the broken parts? Well, Krishna 
conscious philosophy is the ultimate holistic philosophy. We're all part of the supreme whole. Ishava Shaminam Sarvam. We're all part of the supreme whole. And we're all connected. We've just forgotten. Yeah. So, you know, maybe so when you talk about, as you said, awakening people's God consciousness or Krishna consciousness. So, now how do you see communications as a part of that? Would you like to talk about that or would you like to take this in some other direction? No, I love to talk about communications. That's my service to Prabhupada. Yes. Well, communications, as, as, as we understand in the communications ministry, in a broader sense, sometimes we use this little mantra to make a sankirtan friendly world. We know Prophet has his mission. We have the Iskan seven purposes, Lord Chaitanya's whole purpose of coming into the world, Krishna's whole purpose of speaking the Bhagavad Gita. And we also understand that to be effective in spreading Krishna consciousness, we need to help make what we, we use this term, create a favorable environment. And, and we use a real simple example, but I think it's helpful. Just like if we go to do some gardening, let's say it's the springtime after the cold weather, like in, in my part of the world, after the cold weather, spring comes and you go to the garden. So mm -hmm. some might think, well, I just have to go and plant these seeds and then everything will work out nicely. No. First, you have to prepare the garden. You have to turn over the soil. You have to pull out the weeds. Maybe there's some sticks and maybe even some dead things are there from the previous year. You have to put in some fertilizer. You make the soil very favorable, then you plant the seed and it'll grow. So in the same way we're trying to spread Krishna consciousness, we also have to make a favorable environment as much as possible. An example, let's say we're going to go out on, on Harinam in a city where, you know, there's an article in the newspaper that says, Hari Krishna threatens the security of Delhi or, or Washington, D.C., that's going to make it very difficult for us to go in Harinam that day. You know, the mayor is quoted as saying, you know, they're a threat to society, they're dangerous people, they're not good. That's an unfavorable environment. Another situation, if there's, say, just as an example, there's a newspaper article, you know, mayor says, Hari Krishnas give great benefit to all the residents of Delhi or Washington, D.C. or Johannesburg or whatever. That's going to help create a favorable environment. If we have a good relationship with, say, Government agencies, they help us have a Rathiatra. If we have a bad relationship, sometimes they won't allow us to have a Rathiatra. And there's many, many, many examples of this, but I think the point is clear. Uh, just if you're going to plant a seed, you need to prepare the soil. Same way, if we're going to spread Krishna consciousness, it helps us tremendously to create a favorable environment. And that's what communications is largely about as a ministry. How do we create that favorable environment? And then I'll use one other term if I can. We talk about this idea of key audiences. Who are those people or individuals who can really, really help us? So say the police, the government, the media, scholars, our neighbors, parents of devotees. Those are people, if we cultivate a, a good relationship, it can really help us or they can put some barriers up in our efforts to try to share Krishna consciousness. So communications is all about creating a favorable environment. And of course, ultimately with devotees as well. I mean, in one sense, devotees are the most important audience. So mm. I'm working on that, but, but, but uh, we also do say like ISKCON News, it's an effort to help build relationships and information amongst the devotee community itself. But then we also reach out to a lot of others, like I mentioned, to police, government, et cetera, that many people really don't emphasize. Mm. So the idea is that I like the idea of making people friendly or Sankirtan friendly world. So maybe we could also envision this like a pyramid. You know, say maybe toward the top of the pyramid will be people who will be willing to commit themselves to the practice of bhakti. And they will be not, we want them to be as large as possible, but they are going to be relatively less. But yes. if we have a larger number of people who are friendly, then then we can do things for better. So here Absolutely. is Absolutely. one point. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, I'm just agreeing. I'm agreeing. Okay. So in sometimes when we talk about devotees, there is this we they mentality that we are devotees and they are we can have various almost derogatory kind of labels, karmis, materialists, and so many like that. 
so in some ways if we are doing communication we are blurring the sharp um, boundary between devotees and devotee non devotees isn't it like there are shades of gray in between the yeah. two i i would say that sharp boundary is a false boundary oh because so, you earlier said everybody is a devotee potentially everybody is devotee now for the sake of our own krishna consciousness sometimes we have to put we put some walls we put some barriers just like um especially in our early days as devotees i remember when i became a devotee i grew up in a place called uh, a city called detroit in the state of michigan and by krishna's kindness he sent me about 2000 miles away and i joined a temple in denver colorado and i i knew from the very beginning if i was still living in detroit michigan as a young brahmachari you know raised in a very materialistic environment till i was 20 it would have been almost impossible for me to become a devotee because there was too many old friends and old things i used to do and places that reminded me of my material life and my material attachments so krishna gave me a very very new environment <clears throat> to protect me so many of us perhaps all of us that that's essential especially in the early days to really kind of separate ourselves a little bit from those things that allure us to the materialistic energy but as we become more mature then we start seeing you know what material energy i mean not that i'm at that level or advocating that we can artificially be there but at least in a philosophical way we start seeing everything belongs to krishna it's what the it's what the scripture says you know yeah arjuna said krishna i don't want to fight and krishna said it's it's, it's not all about you it's, this is not your war arjuna this is my war you do it for me so i think that uh, and i think this happened in the early years of our movement we, we we should study the social context of our movement and try to understand why things happen a certain way and i know i came in 1975 and there was a tremendous push against the outer society because almost all of us were very young 20 years old and plus or minus a few years we all uh, had had grown up in in very materialistic environments and we had to, we had to push away from that you know we had to see that as as a bad thing and and i think on the negative side it led to a lot of mistreatment of women and 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 uh, lack of appreciation of women because the men you know were reading these things about women can be the cause of our materialistic mentality and young men you know generally uh you know there's a lot of attraction towards women and there's a real tendency to think I'm the enjoyer and she's meant to be enjoyed by me so mm-hmm. to have to separate ourselves and sometimes in our immaturity we did that a little harshly um but i think as as individuals and as a society as we get older um we don't we don't need to do that and we can talk later about being careful we don't go too far mm. but i think the general principle is our movement tours uh i mean just a, again just reading lila rita <coughs> prabhas there in butler pennsylvania and and he's he's seen people and and he's coming to their home to do a little program at night and there's people smoking and they're saying swami ji this must be very disturbing to you and and prabhas said no no think nothing of it Yeah. Think mean, nothing. It doesn't mean he doesn't know cigarettes are bad and cigarettes are sinful and there's bad but he's he's understanding I'm not going to let that put a wall up because these people are all ultimately devotees and we're trying to give a little Krishna consciousness. And of course she was his host so he was being a gentleman. Even one night he came and she said uh, Swami ji uh we I feel bad we haven't cleaned up. They they were they ate meat that family. He said we haven't cleaned up yet. The the smell much bother you. Same thing Prabhu said no no think nothing of it. Mm. You know I like this word to put a wall in between. I had thought more of a demarcating line but it's not just a line it's a wall. So in some ways we might put it like you said initially to defend ourselves or to protect ourselves. But eventually if we have to reach you know if the wall is there we cannot reach people. Yes. So So we yeah, they talk about that an expression like that in English. Any time you build a wall, you have to consider what it, what did we what are we keeping in, but also what are you stopping? What are you preventing from coming in? Mm. No, the wall the, the, so and, and I think another example too is like if you have a little plant or a tree when it's very young, you put a you put a, a some kind of um 
you know, awesome. barrier or cage around to protect it. I think this is even in the Shastra, but as it gets bigger and older, it can give shelter to so many others. So individually, we have to be very, very careful to protect ourselves and as a society to protect ourselves. But as we get stronger, we can give shelter to others and interact with others more and more. Mm. So, as a, so, if in a sense we are engaging with the world, like moving forward, this communication is one way of engaging with the world, and that's not necessarily. We would like if people become devotees, become devotees, but if they become devotee friendly also, that is very helpful for us. Now, when there is a Vida mentality. It often that friendliness, if you don't come in, then it's almost like you are, you are the bad guy. And if you don't come in, almost like you push people away. So when I, when I was a, a new devotee, I still remember this. There was one uh, brahmanchari who was senior to me, and he moved out of the temple after I'd been there for about three or four months. He was initiated. He had a devotee name, but he moved out. And in those days, the term blooping was very popular. You know, yeah. you're in or you're out. And this devotee came back after about a month to the Sunday feast. And I remember everyone's mood was like, oh, you're back. Now you're going to move back in the ashram. And he said, no, I just came for the feast. And we were shocked. We, we didn't know how to, we we'd literally, may I just speak for myself, but I think others, we didn't know, we, I didn't know how to deal with that. It's like, well, wait, if you're back, then you have to live in the ashram and be with us. And if you're not, then you're out there. As opposed to he was one of the earlier people expressing that I'm still a devotee, but I'm just not a brahmachari or a temple resident, which of course now we know most people aren't. But it's yeah. another station of that, of, of, of not understanding you know, the wall, as you said, and, you know, where the barriers are, how, you know, the, sometimes you can have barriers, you, you let in the good, you let out the good, and you, you know, you, you have some barrier against the negative, but it doesn't mean you stop everything. Yes. Okay. You know, it's interesting. I had also heard about this. It's almost like a geographical was equated with the transcendental. It's like a temple premises. If you're inside, then you're transcendental, otherwise you're not. Mm -hmm. So, and, and even, I mean, even uh, in early years, I mean, there was a tendency to think, you know, if you, one, if you are, if you are a serious devotee, you are brahmachari, grahastas mm -hmm. were questioned. And if you were a really serious devotee, at least when I first joined, you had to be a book distributor. And if you weren't a book distributor, your, your integrity, your commitment was questioned. And I think that just comes from a general materialistic perspective of we're always trying to create a, some kind of hierarchy, ultimately with me at the top, right? Because uh, we don't want Krishna to be at the top. But then again, as we get more mature, and, and, it, and it brings up another story I'll just share, a uh, well-known story, I believe. Prabhupada went to Atlanta, and he was speaking to the book distributors, the Sankirtan devotees. And I was a Sankirtan devotee for years as a, as a young devotee, so... You know, I, I have a great appreciation of, of that essential service in our movement. And I benefited from being able to do that full time for many years. But these devotees met with Srila Prabhupada. And one devotee asked him, Prabhupada, what pleases you the most? Hmm. And clearly it was, okay, Guru Maharaj, I'm here. I want you to tell me how wonderful I am. Tell me how special I am. Tell me how special my service is. You know, tell me book distributor is key, key jai, just as an example. Mm -hmm. And Prabhupada answered him as he only Prabhupada was able to do in a very transcendental way. He said, Prabhupada, what service is the most, pleases you most? Prabhupada said, when you love Krishna. So in a sense, Prabhupada was refusing to build that hierarchy or if there is a hierarchy the hierarchy is not based on the service you are doing the hierarchy is at all based on how much you love krishna yes mm. yes and not to minimize the importance of book distribution or or any, you know same way you know we, it, 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 to, to talk about the importance of brahmacharis and grahastas doesn't minimize the importance of sannyasis yeah and we know that sannyasis that you know they're, they're the top of the social hierarchy 
But when we appreciate and understand the need for sannyasis and their most valuable service, and we bow down to them and pay basencies out of a, a sense of gratitude for what they're doing in their sacrifices, that doesn't mean we're minimizing or, 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 or deprecating grahastas. It's all part of the whole. It's holistic, as I said yeah. before. It's interesting when you said just now that there is no that hierarchy we might create. So I earlier gave the example of a pyramid. Now pyramid is almost like a hierarchy. But if you're talking about Krishna consciousness, then that is in the depth of your Krishna consciousness that is there, or the intensity of Krishna consciousness, the hierarchy would be that. And if you combine the pyramid and say the wall metaphor, so it's like climbing up is anyway difficult. But if we build a wall in between, it becomes even more difficult. So yes. if we have that Vita mentality where maybe we are condescending towards others, then we make it more difficult than what is necessary for people to come to Krishna. Yes, yes. And that, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is to make it easier for people. To make it easier for people. And again, it doesn't mean we compromise standards or we minimize or we water anything down. But I mean, just again, classic examples. Shama Sundar Prabhu when Prabhupada asked him to, to, to carve the Jagannath deities. And I'm not sure if he was actually initiated yet or not initiated. I, I really don't know. It's in, I have to go back and reread it. But either way, Prabhupada asked him to carve the Jagannath deities. And if you know the famous story. He was still smoking. Mm. And Prabhupada came in to see how Jagannath was doing. And I think, as I remember correctly, Shamasuna had the pack of cigarettes on the soon-to-be Jagannath deities head. And Prabhupada took his cane and flipped, you know, flipped that off Jagannath's head, something like that, and told him, he said, you know, don't let such a small thing come between you and Krishna. And then what's really significant, he told him, just smoke one less every day. Now, if you look at it in one sense, that means Srila Prabhupada did, you know, in Western cigarettes, I don't know if they changed it, but when I was 18 years old, there was 20 in a pack. So if you have a pack of cigarettes and you smoke one pack a day, the next day you smoke 19, the next day 18, the next day 17, Prabhupada has just allowed him to smoke a lot of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. So we could say, how is it Prabhupada allowing him to smoke? Why didn't he tell him, stop, this is sinful, it's terrible, it's, it's, it's evil, it's intoxication, it's against the... No, smoke one less every day. So what was the, the, the love? What was the support? What was the wisdom, the patience, the care that Prabhupada showed that he said, okay, we know, it's, we know it's bad, but take the next step. One less, one less, one less. Mm. And we're servants of Prabhupada, so we also have to have that same mood. And, and, and if I could, there's one letter I'd like to quote, if I can, real briefly. Just right along the lines of what you're saying about not everyone immediately is going to become a devotee. Mm. But on that pyramid, they can become friends, and they can help us, and they can become this, this key audience, help, helpful so this is a quote from a letter from Prabhupada to Tejas Prabhu in 1973. Mm. Prabhupada writes, If you make some of the big government officials interested in our movement, then our strength will increase. So make them interested. Because we are in the material world, sometimes we require that help. Another point is that if a government officer becomes our admirer or member, then many others will follow. So try to make them sympathizers. Mm -hmm. So in communications, we're also very, un, very much understanding this. Yes, we like everybody to become a devotee, everybody become a member of VSCA. We want to provide full facility for people, and everyone has that potential. But it's, it's not all going to happen overnight. And Prabhupada directly said, make them sympathizers. If we can help people appreciate our movement, then... It opens so many doors. It's spiritual advancement for them just to appreciate us. It's spiritual advancement. And as Prabhupada says, because we're in the material world, we need help. So rather than thinking us versus them and, and alienating people, sometimes offending people, unnecessarily criticizing people, we can see that actually we're in the material world. We need people's help. Here's a person that can help us. Maybe he's a meat eater. He can still help us. Maybe he's an atheist. He can still help us. Maybe this neighbor is total nonsense, but they can still help us. At least they can stop complaining to the police about our morning kirtans if we build a little relationship with them. So those are some of the ways that in the communications ministry we try to engage with the world. Yeah. 
So two are interested and sympathizers. That's a quite a different paradigm from, like I said, making people devotees. And because if we have this almost one zero mentality, so to the extent we try to pull people in, those who don't come in also it seems get pulled out, get pushed out, yes. and then we we end up making uh, making enemies unnecessarily quite often. Yes, because it's just like you know. They sometimes they talk about in family dynamics. Say the father wanted to be a famous football player, mm. and somehow he wasn't successful. So he has a son. So he tries to force his son to be a famous football player. The son wants to play at you know the tabla. <laughs> okay. The father's not happy with that. No, no, you can't play tabla. You have to be. Fo- and sometimes, you know. People, uh, their lives are ruined because they're forced a- a- instead of saying, okay, you know, in a Christian conscience example, okay, play the tabla for Krishna or play football for Krishna. In America, there's a, there's a young man now who uh, comes from a devotee family. And uh, last time I heard, he's, he's playing professional football. So he has those particular skills. So maybe one day he becomes famous and I don't, Maybe one day they interview him. You know, what is it that inspires you? Well, I'm a vegetarian, first of all, a 300-pound vegetarian, and I offer my my food to Krishna. And I don't know what he's going to say, but, you know, for somebody to come in and say, no, no, you have to, you know, shave your head and move in the ashram and be a brahmachari. No, nah, that's not what he's meant to do. Mm-hmm. You know, some people came to Prabhupada and they wanted to paint. Some people wanted to play music. Some people became big, big organizers. Some people learned to dress the deities. Some people just gave a little bit of money. You know, some exactly. people helped like, uh, incorporate the ISKCON, and, and that's all they did. And Prabhupada wasn't like, no, no, you have to join her. It's useless. And, you know, the, 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 you're bringing back all these classic stories of the drunk who, who, who stumbles into 26 Second Avenue. Yeah. Some rolls of toilet paper. Prabhupada said, just see how easy it is to do service. I mean, devotees were shocked. They were watching, how's Prabhupada going to react to this bum who smells of alcohol stumbling in the little 26 Second Avenue? But Prabhupada's vision was, ah, just see, he has some bhakti. He wants to do service. Mm-hmm. This might be a silly question. Is, did Prabhupada even use toilet paper at all? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that question. You'll have to ask Kari Sori Prabhu. I don't know. Yeah. But either way, for, for yeah. Westerners coming, something they had in the bathroom, the toilet area, because they wouldn't know they wouldn't know what a lota filled with water was. Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So this uh, this thing about uh, Prabhupada in the yeah, early days, it, yeah, it was the public toilet in the back of the little temple room there. Yeah, I remember. I see the twenty six second avenue. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, little. T- you know, I had a discussion with Kalakan Prabhu a month ago. And he made a very interesting point. He said, it's gone in the 60s and it's gone in the 70s was quite different. And he says that uh, we in our movement have standardized it's gone of the 70s. But whereas in, Christ- in, uh, in Krishna house, he says we are trying to cre- recreate the mood of the 60s. And he said in the 60s true. it was a more of family atmosphere, and there was not so much of a demand that you have to do this and you don't have to do this. But by the 70s, when it became very big, the demand started increasing, the standards and all those things. So in a sense, the walls started getting built. So that yeah. was a very striking observation. And some of the incidents you said reminded me of that. Yeah, and I, I, I would just add to that. I think that um, we should look and see what were the things we did very well in the 60s and keep those alive. And what were the things we didn't do very well? And what were the things that we did well in the 70s and keep those? And what were the things we didn't do very well? I mean, Krishna okay. consciousness is very much a culture of self-reflection, self-improvement, you know, self-critique, community critique. And in a broader scale, I, this is something else in communication that I think it's very important, that healthy people are open to see how they can improve. You know, people that aren't so psychologically or spiritually healthy, very difficult for them to take feedback because they're very weak, insecure. perhaps. Insecure. Very? 
And I think as a say, yeah, insecure. And I, or maybe they're just, you know, they're not, they're not trained to do it. There may be people that are very secure people, but they're not trained to take feedback. But I think when we, as individuals and as, as a temple and as a international movement, when we take feedback from people, and sometimes that can be rather harsh, which is one of the things that happens when you engage with people. They're going to point out to you, you know, what are you doing well? What are you doing wrong? What do they like about what you're doing? What do they not like about what you're doing? And we need to be strong enough to be able to say, you're right. We're not doing that very well. And take, take that as impetus. I mean, I, again, rereading the Lila Mrita, Prabhupada had two people. I'm trying to remember who they were. One was a military man and someone else to admire or someone who was reading back to God it suggested to Prabhupada, you should write books. I think maybe one was a librarian, and then yeah. the other was a military man. And Prabhupada said he took that as Krishna speaking to him. So Prabhupada wasn't like, wait, you know, I'm a sannyasi, you know, renounced person, advanced Vaishnava, who are you? Are you just some little librarian? I think maybe the librarian was a woman, I'm not sure. You know, you can't give me instructions. You're a military man, what do you know? Prabhupada was like, oh, here's some good ideas I can use for Krishna. And, and that's, you know, that was the impetus that the Lord used to, 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 to have him write so many books. Amazing. I never thought of that incident in these terms. So that if we have walls, then it's almost like we are not going to take anything from them. The whole idea is we have to give them. And then they only have to come our way. So we, we, we will, so that's the interesting aspect that and if people see that we are going to take feedback, that also makes them a little more appreciate us for being humble and that also creates a friendly attitude. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, in my part of the world, sometimes we meet, then you generally they're, they're like a cr Christians who are a little overly committed to their tradition from my perspective. And they can be a little pushy and a little obnoxious. And it, for many of us, it just, it pushes you away. Whether someone comes up and says, you know, I'm a Christian, what are you doing? Tell me about what you're doing. Let me share what I'm doing. We can have a nice, I can learn from them. I can learn from them. Yeah, and I, I think that um, as a mature organization, we, we can be deeply rooted in our conviction about Krishna, Lord Chaitanya, and Prabhupada, and Vaishnava culture, and all of our practices. And at the same time, be open to the fact, like you just mentioned, in the 70s, maybe we swung too far in the 70s. You know, maybe we're swinging too far right now in some way. Maybe, maybe you know, this or that. To be mm -hmm. self-critical, always, oh, how can we do better? And, you know, always remember, we're, we're imperfect beings, and we're always wanting to learn better. Even in our philosophy, when it's described, Prabhupada says, it's not like we'll even ever know everything about Krishna. There's always more to learn about Krishna. Eternally, he's too, he's infinite. What That's to speak really of now, trying to figure out how to live in this world, so much more we can learn. So, when we, so, one, I'm just, we're just talking about, say, how to avoid breaking the wall. I thought, thought three things you discussed till now. One is, understand that they're potentially already devotees. Uh, they're all, it's not that they're non-devotees. Yeah, at least at a philosophical level, you understand that. The second thing you mentioned is that, there are multiple ways in which they can be engaged. So rather than thinking this is what they have to do, maybe they can be engaged where they are. And third thing is we can learn also from them. So this is... Uh, yes. So then by all this, we are creating, a, as you said, a friendly environment. Now going back to just that pyramid and wall thing. So one is that, say we lower the wall if it's like a say a movable wall, something like that, so that there can be flow. So is there, uh, how much if you go to, uh, how much do we engage with the world? There is, uh, for example, now, earlier you mentioned that if somebody just became a householder, they were considered almost to be like having left the movement. Now, yeah. if I Follow. consider... Follow. Fallen, fallen, yeah. Yeah, fall down. So now, fall down. Say now, if say, some devotees, say we speak to devotees in India, we have got 
good outreach programs in top colleges. So then there are some students who are very passionate about their engineering, about their studies. Now, they would probably in future become big scientists and researchers and stuff like that. And sometimes when we become Krishna conscious, the idea is that, okay, you do good studies, you get good marks, but focus your energy primarily on your, uh, on your Krishna consciousness, on practicing it, on sharing it. So if we consider from the level of engagement with the world, say if a devotee has a passion for their profession, so would that, now if the profession is, say if somebody is in music and they can do music for Krishna, it's easier. But if the profession doesn't have anything directly connected with Krishna, then how much is like a passionate engagement with one's profession? Now I'm not using the word passion here in the sense of the mode of passion. But passion more in the sense of a great drive or great attraction. So, is this well, I was a new or I'm going off a different track now? No, no, it's very good. When I was a new devotee in, in Denver, Colorado, I remember some man came to the temple and he really wanted to be a devotee. And he was a concert pianist. He played piano. Okay. And a typical engagement for new devotees and for us in those days especially was you were asked to wash pots. There were always so many pots to wash. Big, big Sunday feast and so many offerings a day. So you had to wash pots. So washing pots meant you put your hands in hot, hot water. Sometimes there's knives. Sometimes your fingers get hit by a pot, this and that. And for a concert pianist to ask him to take his hands and take, put them at risk was very foolish. And as I remember it, that was a huge block for him. And he pretty much went away because we had this idea. A new devotee, you have to wash pots. When I was new, I had to wash pots. You're new, you have to wash pots. Mm -hmm. Same way, you know, when I was a new devotee, I lived as a Brahmin for 10 years or one year. You have to live in the ashram for one year, etc. And that's just not true. And, um, you know, different, even we know, we look at the life of Srila Prabhupada, again, re recently rereading Lilamrita, and it explains that Prabhupada's own father was thinking, well, I could, I could give my son to some sannyasi. He could grow up, and, but who actually, where is he going to be protected? Who's going to actually cultivate him as the Vaishnavas that his father wanted him to be? So somebody could say, oh, Prabhupada was never in Brahmanchari. He didn't live in the ashram. Well, they, time, place, and circumstance, his father did the best for his Krishna consciousness. Mm. So I think that's the essential thing. And I know I've seen in some of the temples I'm involved in, sometimes there's devotees, congregational devotees, and sometimes they're very enthusiastic, but sometimes a little immature, and they have a preaching program or a Bhakti Vriksha or uh, different names they use for programs at their homes. <clears throat> and sometimes in their mind, everyone that comes, we, we're trying to make disciples. Everyone is coming to be we, this pyramid, right? Like you said. So, so many people come, so we introduce them, and slowly, slowly, we want to make disciples. And if they're coming, but they don't show any interest in becoming a disciple, or chanting 16 rounds, then we filter them out, because that's not what we're looking for. I think that's grossly wrong. I think it's, personally, I feel it's a violation of Krishna consciousness. It's immature, and it's harmful, because we have to have a big scope, which is, we have temples where we're going to have, we want to make sannyasis. We want to make brahmacharis. We want to make temple residents. We want to make people that if they're not full-time, they get 50% or 75% of their income to the temple that come every single morning. We want that class of commitment, but not everyone's going to do it, especially in the beginning. And most people are going to be one step at a time. <clears throat> so we have to create an environment. That everyone feels welcome and everyone can, can make progress. <clears throat> You know, we should, a little, a little bit of like they talk about being in the stretch zone. We want people in the stretch zone. But if we put so much pressure on people, as you said, they'll leave. And there's even a letter like that from Prophet in the early days. He said, when new people come, they shouldn't be pushed prematurely to enter the temples because if you do, they'll leave. Prophet also said, just as you said a few moments ago. Oh. You know, this brings one point that there is standardization and there is, we could say, individualization. So that this is the standard thing you have to do as a devotee. But people are individuals. 
so is standardization at one level a result of institutionalization or especially when an institution like institution becomes big we will have to create some standards but how much look because in one sense the vidya mentality comes in when they have the standards they are not following the standards and this person is following the standards so how much room for individualization can we create if you look at the first purpose of iskan he propagated road it is to systematically propagate Christian consciousness, right? Systematically propagate spiritual knowledge. knowledge. He didn't even say and, and correct the imbalance of values. Yes, he yeah. didn't say to standardize. If you say there's a standard, that implies there's one standard, and everything else is, to use your analogy, outside the wall. If you say it's systematic, just like if you go, education is a system. There's a system for kindergartners is the term they use in America. When they're yeah. four or five years old, they come and they play all day long. That's the system. Mm. There's a system for first graders. There's a system for sixth graders. There's, a, there's different standards at different levels, but it's all part of a system to help people advance. And if you're really smart, like say Radhika Raman Prabhu in America, you know, when he was 12 or something, he went to high school with the 17 year olds. So the standards were at 12, you should study this, but they advanced him because the system was meant to promote education. And similarly, if someone's a little slow or struggling in a certain area, they put you into a group with younger students because the purpose of the system is to help train you, not to force you into some standard. It, it, frankly, it's impersonal and ignores the fact we're all humans. And, you know, all of us, like, you know, I'm pretty good about certain things. There's other things I'm not good at at all. And and Prabhu Chaitanya Prabhu, maybe you have the same thing. There's certain things you maybe you're really good at, some things you're not good at all. And if someone comes in and says, Here's the standard, you know, <clears throat> new to me, you have to be able to climb a tree in a minute and a half. Well, sorry, I can't do that. You know, I don't have that ability. I used to be able to stay up all night long for Rathi after events and things like that. But these days I gotta go home and go to sleep. I, I don't have that capacity anymore. Mm -hmm. Very, I never thought of this very clear difference between systematic and standardized. So systematic means basically, it's like there, is, there, there are paths, we could continue the pyramid example, we could say there are different paths to go up the pyramid. And there is a system, okay, if you take this path, you might go a little slowly, and this is what you'll encounter. If you take this path, you'll go this way up. So it's systematic, but it is not standardized. And... You know, in the goal, of, yeah. the goal of a guru or an elder or a parent or a preacher or a leader is to try to help people work their way up, you know, according to what they can do and not force that, but to see what everybody, you know, what, what are the unique talents and abilities that everyone, everyone has and help them. I just read a purport this morning. I gave class for the devotees in, um, at the Krishna house. And it was about sati, and sati with, mm. at the Daksha Yagya. And it's, it, 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 and, and Prabhupada, and it's, it's 4, 4, 12. Prabhupada talks about an advanced person sees the good qualities in others. They don't see the bad. So in a similar way, I think an advanced person, and then those of us that aren't advanced, but we're trying to act like that to please our gurus, please Prabhupada, we see the potential in people. We, we fan the spark, as we used to say so many times. And, and, and wherever somebody is inclined, we, we encourage that. And, and, and we don't focus on the negative. So let's say there's a police officer that's very enthusiastic to help us, you know, get, get permits because he thinks we're nice people. But he's an atheist and he's a meat eater. Okay, gradually maybe we can help him get over that. But we don't reject him. We engage him. We, we take his help. We appreciate that. Mm. You know, this just struck me when you're talking about police officer. If you look at Prabhupada's conversations with VIPs, Prabhupada has robust intellectual exchanges, but I think Prabhupada is never demanding any lifestyle changes from them. Prabhupada even doesn't even like tell if he meet, meets Arnold Toynbee or somebody like that, he's not telling him to chant Hare Krishna or do this or don't do this. So Prabhupada is also multifaceted in the way he approach different people yes yes and then another story comes to my mind with Rina Nanda Maharaj talks about how 
and I'm just going to have the basic flow. I may not have all the details, but he was with Prabhupada and he drank some water and, and or, or took a little prasadam, something just popped in. And then Prabhupada chastised him because he didn't immediately go and wash his hands. And then a little later, there were more people in the room and they stirred some prasadam out. And Rida Nandamaraj was thinking, okay, I've heard from my guru. These people have to wash their hands. So he went to get like a pitcher and something, you know, somehow to help them. And Prabhupada chastised him again. Why are you making so much trouble? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> so I think he was thinking, this is the standard. But no, what's the system? They can learn to wash their hands after they eat later. Right now, we want them to like Krishna and to understand the value of it and the depth of it. That's the first step. These other things can come later. Oh, and, you know, I think, I, think, I think something that comes to my mind, too, is like in those early years, in those 70s, there were a lot of, you know, young sannyasis were coming up and young brahmacharis. And we all, us brahmacharis, we looked forward to becoming sannyasis. That was the goal. And when we didn't, a lot of people became discouraged and went away. You know, they felt, okay, I, it's, it's, I, I can't be a grahas, I can't be a sannyasi, I should just leave Krishna consciousness. And that was a, that was a tremendous loss. And, you know, now we see, you know, sannyasis a few years ago, I started noticing this maybe 10 years ago, sannyasis going to weddings of guru kulis, second generation devotees. Now, in one sense, what's the sannyasi going to a wedding and blah, blah, blah. But no, those same sannyasis are elders. They're honored persons. They're people that give blessings. And if I'm a young man or young woman, I'm getting married in some sannyasi, I've who's 50, 60 years old. I've known him since I was a kid. I look up to him. I revere him. And he comes to my wedding. How much that, that, that binds my heart to him and to Krishna? Because, you know, at these, at these important stages of life, to a person, you know, sets aside, okay, for himself, he has no interest in getting married. He doesn't deal with these kind of mundane things. But to help me and to show his care, He's willing to come and be there, and how important that is to me. So th these are some of the transitions and the maturity I've, I, I, I've been able to see in our movement over the last years, and it, it's, uh, it, it's encouraging and it's inspiring, and it, and it gives me strength to see that we can take that kind of youthful enthusiasm and mix it with some mature wisdom. Beautiful. So, you know, what would was considered strictness or what would see like so earlier we might have black and white mentality this is strictness and this is lax, laxity but now we might understand that that strict in the name of strictness we are simply alienating people and they're actually not being lax but we are actually connecting people and bringing them bringing krishna deeper into their hearts yes I so, mean, as we should be strict with ourselves and flexible with others yeah you know, and it's right out of the Gita, right? Sixth chapter, Krishna says, uh, one who's moderate or one who's regulated, it's translated differently sometimes, in their habits of eating, sleeping, working, and recreation, can conquer all the pains of the material world by the practice of yoga. So that sense of balance and moderation, very, very important for ourselves and the way we interact with the world. Yeah. So this reminds me of Niyamagraha, actually. That means sometimes this is the root or this is the standard, but the purpose of the standard is to help people rise up, not to make them feel bad or to push them away. So yes. if we stick to the letter of the rule without, while forgetting the purpose of the rule, then that would be a problem. So you could say a system, a system has different standards at different levels, like an educational system. And the key is, to find out what standard works for the person at that level. Yes. Is, is something like that? Yes, yes. yes. And, and, and then when you talk about engaging with the outside world at large, as you mentioned earlier, we can bring people to Krishna consciousness, we can make friends with people, we can learn from them. Mm. And, and also, and this is very important, we talk about this is one of the principles of, of communications. We have five principles. One of them is to look for win-win or mutually beneficial relationships. Mm. And I give an example of this again that I just read in the Lila Rita. 
that famous part of Prabhupada's early outreach internationally, he tried to go to that cultural event in Japan. And he was yes. going to bring the, uh, you know, he, those beautiful 50 paintings, the description of autumn from, from, the, from the Bhagavatam. And eventually it didn't work out. But kind of a subplot that I saw rereading Lilamrita recently, the organizers at one point asked Prabhupada if they would, if he would write to the mayors of those cities in Japan about the programs that they were hosting. So they're talking to Prabhupada, you please come and you spread your Vedic Vaishnav teachings and, and, and the glories of India's spiritual culture. That will help you, Swamiji. We need your help to convince the mayors, the government leaders, the political leaders of our place so we get whatever they wanted. I don't know, the details aren't told, you know, more money from the government, more support, more publicity. And at this point, Prabhupada wasn't even committed to go. Prabhupada could have, I mean, it wasn't, he wanted to go, but he, he wasn't for sure he was going to be able to. Prabhupada could have said, well, no, 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 I'm not going to help you with your mundane event because if I'm not there and Krishna's not there, it's all my, it's all useless. He wasn't like building walls. He wrote to those mayors on their request to try to, you know, help promote their event. So he's getting help from them and he's willing to help them. I mean, there's so many stories, you know, Prabhupada walking on the morning walk and, you know, walking down and walking across somebody's lawn, you know, in America, private property is a big deal, walking across somebody's uh, little pathway to turn off the water that's dripping from their faucet. Well, why is he doing that? Well, what do we care if they, you know, they, they can waste their money, you know, blah, blah, et cetera. But no, it's, it's Krishna. It's Krishna's water, you know, and let me help them by turning off the water. You know, there's stories of Prabhupada walking, a morning walk, and somebody sitting in their car two or three mornings in a row. Prabhupada notices the man. He walks over and knocks on the window. The man rolls down his window. Prabhupada says, good morning. <laughs> Just says good morning. Just a gentlemanly thing. You know, there's other stories. Prabhupada on a morning walk in, in Juhu Beach with, I think it was Juhu, with some, some of his senior disciples. And they walk by some, some Mayavadi sannyasi. And as soon as they pass, Prabhupada, like, slammed his cane down to his furious. He said, why you did not pay obeisances? He's a sannyasi. Why you did not pay obeisances? You know, we may think, wait, but they're Mayavadis and they're offenders, you know, all the different things we learn. But in terms of the personal interaction, Prabhupada said, no, he's a sannyasi. You have to pay obeisances to a sannyasi. You have to respect them. Doesn't mean we follow them. Doesn't mean we agree with their philosophy, but we have to respect them. So in the same way, the police, the government people, the neighbors, you know, making friends with people, you know, trying to gradually introduce Krishna to them or trying to, you know, have a favorable environment so they don't complain about the noise or, you know, maybe they allow, a, like, like in Washington, D.C., where I live, the temple president, Ananda Rindavandasi, she's cultivated very nice relationships with the other religious communities. So on Janmashtami, we use their parking lots. We have buses. We have way too many people. We have thousands of people, nowhere to park. So we have buses we hire, and they drive and park people in, like, at the church. And I think there's a mosque. I think I know there's a mosque part of the group. There's a there's a, a like a Catholic church, a Protestant church, maybe a synagogue. I'm not sure of the mix. And we help each other. And we don't agree theologically, but we value that they're also trying to help people be God conscious according to what they understand. We're trying to do the best we can. We're neighbors. You know, we're, we're still neighbors. Even the atheists were neighbors with the atheists. So, you know, why, why, why put up unnecessary walls? So in this way, there's, there's mutual relationships. And sometimes she goes and speaks at their place, and sometimes they come to our place, take prasadam, and, you know, gradually, gradually the relationships grow. Yes. They just one thought struck me that, that in some ways there are there are certain philo philo we have philosophy and we have practices hmm? and we often uh, label people based on their whether they agree with our philosophy or not or whether they are adopting the practice they are following certain practices or not say for example somebody is meat, meat, meat or not but you know people are not just de de defined only by their ideology or by their particular behavior particular habit 
so people are multifaceted and so the, the culture like you, you talk about the cultural interaction just good morning or whatever so we don't necessarily have to look at people's particular practices or even people's particular beliefs so we can just connect with people at a human level so because in our could it be that this is this question could it be that because in our tradition we emphasize a lot on philosophy and on practices then they become almost like filters through which we see everyone so if somebody is and then that's how the walls come up so i'm just now i'm trying to understand what brings the walls up so we shouldn't have the walls up but could it be this be something our own over emphasis on uh, seeing people through certain prisms yeah, i think that's a good word over emphasis because as there's no doubt the shastra says you know the deep dark well of 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 household life you know if one is a green lady talks about you know woman is the source of illusion for man there's verses that talk about a woman who thinks her husband is the provider or sees me you know that the husband the man becomes maya for her um you know wealth and and you know all these things are described as 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 dangers for devotees so i mean with bard maharaj the the, the whole chapters in the bhagavatam about how he was so great and yet he got attached to a deer i mean there's a lot of warnings Mm. so we we can't minimize those prapa talks about in the gita in the purport he talks about there's danger even on the royal roads when has so so the caution has to be there but we don't overly emphasize the caution we are prapa and nugas prapa didn't stay in vrindavan how how risky was it for him health wise to get on that boat how risky was it for him to violate what most people thought was hindu dharma which is to not get on that boat how risky was mm. it for He's a you know Shaktivesh avatar, but just in general, to to one lone person to go to a to a, a, a place like America, and try to bring Krishna. How risky was it was when Prabhupada sent his disciples all around the world? I mean, those were phenomenal risks, but but they but they took it because they had that vision of 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 being open and trying to you know build relationships and bring bring people to Krishna consciousness. So. we have to be aware of the risk but not to the point that we become stagnant or stifled or stereotypical um because let's say you know probably came I, again i just read just been reading the last few days so it's been fresh on my mind probably was staying with dr mishra the uptown swami and when he moved to this location on the bowery which was about as low as you can go in the social hierarchy described sometimes people would die they they die outside in the you know he tried to get in there be a dead body sitting outside where he's trying to get up to his place um and a different type of people came there you know the younger people artists and musicians and the older people the kind of stuffy people they were a little less comfortable they stopped coming but proper didn't say no no i don't want to talk to hippies i don't want to talk to young people i don't want to talk to people that take drugs i don't want to talk to people that have an illicit relationships i want to talk to anybody who wants to hear about krishna and anyone is willing to help about krishna to help krishna to help me in my service to krishna so there's this like openness of of trying to like you gave the pyramid we want to help everyone come up but we don't force people we appreciate people you know it's like a book distributor like again i remember you know in in my early years and lately it's changed and i i fall at the feet of all the book distributors especially by sheshika prabhu for what he's done for cultural transformation and vijay prabhu and others we were kind of pushed you know if somebody wants to give you 5 dollars you should push him for 10 you know try to give him to give as much as they possibly can and we made a lot of enemies we made because it was like i'm determining how much this person should give to krishna rather than inspire them i'm trying to force them and it made a lot of enemies and i know these days vaisheshika kapoor in the book distributing ministries they teach devotees no no the first you just you just want to be grateful to people and then they just touch the book so that kind of spirit of giving and openness and gratitude and appreciation and when you have that people automatically they give you 10 or 20 or something else or if they don't next time they think like wow those were such nice people next time i see them i have to get one of those books and planting that desire is at least as important as whether or not they take that book because in my day many times people would buy a book i don't think this ever happened in india but in america it happened in that period of the 70s they would buy a book 
walk down the hallway in the airport and rip that book into shreds because we had been so pushy and at least me, maybe nobody else did, but I did it a few times. I had been so pushy and, and frankly obnoxious in the way we dealt with them. They were angry and frustrated and then went away bitter against Krishna. We, you know, so, okay, we were young, we were immature, we were trying. You know, there was benefit. A lot of books went out. We can't look back and say that was a useless era. Not at all. That was very important. A lot of wonderful things happened. A lot of many, many people came. A lot of those people who were offended later on, they got over it. It wasn't like, you know, shut, shut the walls down. But looking back, we should learn from those shortcomings. Mm -hmm. And we should be more, more mature. Like the father, he forces his one son to play, play tabla. You know, maybe the second time around, he realizes, okay, this son wants to play violin. Let him play violin. Yeah. But let me help the best violin player. And let me, as devotees, let me help him play violin for Krishna. Yes. You know, you mentioned uh, out of your humility certain extreme things which maybe you did in the earlier years. I think about it also, even now, if I hear some of the talks I gave about 10, 15 years ago, there are so many times I wince when I hear some points. You know, how could I have been so judgmental, such generalization, such blanket criticisms? So is it almost like a universal uh, phase in the growth of a spiritualist that initially we will be somewhat judgmental and then we will... So like earlier we talked about building the walls. So is it that everybody will go through that phase of uh, being a little judgmental, alienating, and then maturing? I'm, I'm not such a scholar of these things, but I, I think so. I'm sure it's there in the Shastra. I'm sure that's just a symptom. I mean, uh, uh, you know, Kanishta Adhikari, he only sees Krishna in the temple. He okay. doesn't, he doesn't, and he doesn't, he doesn't appreciate devotees. And then at the highest stage, you know, of course we can't imitate this. And, and what I'm talking about is not trying to be a, a pseudo Uttama Adhikari. But in the advanced stage, one starts seeing everybody's connected with Krishna. And, uh, and, and, and therefore, we're, we're reconnecting people. You know, I mean, like in, I was thinking, I just have the ISKCON interface statement here, which is online. Everyone, if you haven't read this, I really encourage devotees to take a look. You can just look that up. Just, just Google ISKCON interface statement. And uh, it talks about the broad-mindedness that we should have in relationship with people of other traditions. And it just, there's a couple quotes here that are, that are referenced here. This is Bhaktinoda Thakur. It is not proper to constantly propagate the controversial superiority of the teachers of one's own country over those of another country or faith, you can understand. Although one may, nay one should, cherish such a belief in order to acquire steadiness in a faith of your own. But no good can be affected to the world by such quarrels. So in the beginning, we have to go very, very, very deep in our own Christian consciousness. And as I mentioned, like my experience in Detroit, I needed to be separated from that place. Mm. But when I'm stronger, then I'm not so threatened by those things. So maybe when I'm a young brahmachari, I'm, you know, women and my own desire to, you know, exploit women is a big problem for me. I got to keep away from women. But when I'm in church sannyasi within the proper etiquette, I can go to people's homes and I can appreciate, thank you, Manaji, for cooking. And, and how are you and Prabhu doing together? And, oh, you I, you, you, you know, show me the new baby, you know, whatever. Because if we're mature, those, those things, we, we're not threatened by those because we start to see it as Krishna's energy, not, not just Maya. And again, not sentimental. We can't be artificial. We have to be very, very careful. Mm -hmm. but, but, but to find that, that balance. Yeah, this is beautiful that like, you started with uh, you, it, there is precaution and there are risks. So in a sense, maturity means to know when we should be cautious and when we should be taking risks. So if we are, yeah. if we are taking risks prematurely, that's a problem. But if we are excessively yeah. cautious, then also we will not be able to be effective. Yes. Yeah. And I think in the beginning, it's good to be overly cautious. But we can't be paralyzed. And as we mature, we have to be willing to take reasonable risks. And part of that risk, we have to make sure we have good association. We have to make sure we're deeply rooted in Christian consciousness. We have to, we have to watch out for the warning signs. You know, if I start, even as a, a preacher, 
I go to someone's home and I start thinking, wow, you know, this is a beautiful home. Maybe I should have a house like this. Prabhupada mentions that if a sannyasi thinks like that, he's immediately fallen. Mm -hmm. So if the rest of us do, we, if we start thinking, oh, you know, these people are so nice. Maybe I should associate with them more than devote. You know, we have to watch out for those things. That, that, that's Maya eats away at our, our Christian consciousness. And be, be yeah. careful with Right, Prabhupada said, uh, you know, your first duty is to become Krishna conscious and save yourself. So we can't be naive, but again, not be, uh, not be entrenched in this us versus them, but broaden our views. Yeah, that's cool. You know, maybe I can mention one last story, and then I actually, maybe we could continue it some other time, but I'm in, in real yeah, life, I'm yeah. supposed to go to participate in a ceremony for Bhakti Chumraj. But I'll mention one thing. When, we, when I first organized an interfaith dialogue in, in, uh, in Boston, and we had some very good people, some big, a very, very big scholar and new religious movements. We had a big professor who later went on to Harvard. We had one of the biggest people writ, writing an interfaith from the Christian side. And the many senior devotees, uh, Tamar Christian Raj was there, Shonaka Rishi from the Oxford Center, many, many others, some men, some ladies, etc. And I chose the topic. I was the convener. And the topic was the kingdom of God. And I chose that topic because I knew Christians have an idea of kingdom of God, and we have a kingdom of God. But I thought, we have so much to say on this one. And we're really strong on this. We can really shine in this dialogue. They're going to see what we have to offer. And uh, it was a two- or three-day event, and, and maybe halfway through it, at one point, one of the, the, the people there said, why don't we go around and talk about our own experienced or thoughts about kingdom of God in our tradition and how it inspires us. And, you know, devotees were talking about it. It's so lovely because Krishna's there in Vrindavan and he plays a flute and he plays with the cows and, you know, this, you know, and the Christians didn't have much to say, frankly. And I was feeling a little proud, I think. And uh, I got to one scholar, Larry Shin, who's written, did a lot of writing, a lot of studying about Niskan. He's a Methodist minister, also a PhD. And he said something to this effect. He said, you know, in my tradition, it doesn't really talk that much about the kingdom of God. But what it teaches me is I should try to help manifest the kingdom of God in this world. I should try to be a good Christian. I should try to help my fellow Christian. I should try to help my neighbor. I should try to learn to serve others. I should try to alleviate the pain in this world. And this was like 1996 or so. This is right when ISKCON was becoming aware of the, the history of child abuse. There was a lot of social upheaval, in a sense, in ISKCON about, you know, uh, you know, the New Vrindavan community had been kicked out and was just coming back in. And, and we were starting to realize that, you know, we didn't have everything figured out. And as this wonderful man, Larry Shin, was speaking, I felt myself shrinking. Because I'm thinking, oh, we have this beautiful philosophy. But then as he's speaking, I'm thinking, yeah, how well are we manifesting Vaishnava culture in our communities? I mean, obviously, we're doing wonderful things, but there's a lot of room for improvement, especially in those days. How well are we taking care of our families? How well are we taking care of women? How well are we taking care of children? How well are we, are, are, do our neighbors all love us because we're such nice people? You know, do, are we making are people appreciating us? Are the government stepping up to help us because we've done such a good job telling them who we are? Are we manifesting what it means to be a Vaishnav the way he's given his life to try to be a good Christian? Mm. And that, then it really, it struck me like, oh my gosh, we have a lot to learn from these people. It's not just about us telling them about Krishna is blue and he plays the flute. That's wonderful. We can share that. That's an amazing revelation given to us. But we have a lot of things to learn from other people. And if we're open to a win-win engagement, um, and again, it doesn't mean we say, okay, we're going to start eating the bad stuff they eat. No, obviously, that's not the point. Mm. But we, we can take the things, because, you know, look at the Christians, look at Muslims, look at Jews, look at our neighbors, look at, you know, they all have things we can learn. And, and I think part of being a devotee of Krishna is seeing the Krishna's everywhere. And Krishna speaks to me, as Prabhupada had a military man and a librarian, he said, Krishna spoke through those people to tell them to publish books. We certainly can have neighbors and Christians and the police and the government and scholars and these other people also, in addition to making friends, and some of them may become devotees, but in addition to that, to be able to open to hear from them how we can do better, I think is very much a big part of what it means to be Krishna conscious. Yes, thank you. Maybe I'll just quickly summarize 
and if I miss out something, then you can add. So yes. we discussed. Uh, eventually, I I think our topic morphed into something like going beyond the V-Day mentality or creating a friendly environment, creating a devotee friendly environment. So you started by talking about in Lila Amrit, you said Prabhupada was intent as well as flexible in how he was reaching out to people. And then when we talked about the how there is initially there was a very strong insider outsider kind of mentality and the geographical and transcendental considered equal. So then you said it's not just a, like a boundary but a wall and then that wall will prevent us from sharing Krishna consciousness also. So for that purpose, at one level, we need to protect ourselves. So in that sense, it's required in the initial years of our devotees' life. But eventually, we need to we need to lower the walls. And we discussed overall some ways to. We also use another metaphor of a pyramid. So ways to lower the walls. One way is that we understand that we, even if people don't become devotees, they can become friends. They can become friendly. So it's not a one zero thing. And also you talk about we can learn, they can do things for other us apart from becoming devotees also. Where they are, they might be able to do a lot of things also. Then we can also learn from them. And if we try to force them, then they might actually, it might backfire and they may become enemies. So you made a very significant difference between systematic and standardized. So... That means systematic means there can be different standards for different people at different levels, just like in education. And it is our maturity to understand where a person is and encourage them appropriately. So eventually, we want people to rise up the pyramid, but wherever they are, we want to encourage and help them from where they are. And then toward the end, you discuss several experiences of how you know, Prabhupada did not... Prabhupada was always cultured and uh, gentlemanly with everyone. And sometimes based on the filter of philosophy or certain regulatory principles practice, we might almost dehumanize others and then not give them adequate respect and, and uh, cordiality. So then, and you concluded toward the end by talking about how when we... The same, same like the Dhanamara, the example was very striking that as one standard for one person that wash your hands after uh, eating, but no, not the same standard for others. So that maturity, and you talked also about that instead of trying to prove our superiority to others, other traditions, you know, we try to, if we have to try to learn from them, then even if they have lesser theological revelations than us, still there is something we can learn from them. So I would say one of the strongest ways to break this uh, Vide mentality is having a learning attitude. And if we have a learning attitude, that would also mean that we will know, you know this is not something that I need to learn or I want to learn. So there are some things which we don't want to adopt from them. But that learning attitude could help us. Any concluding thoughts, Prabhu? Yeah, that, that's a very wonderful what, what you've said. And, and one thing enters my mind is that you know, described in, in, in the Bhagavatam, right, the different brahmanas and, and, and how they're, you know, they, they, they have their, what, 25, 26 different gurus, and they learn this from the bird, and this from the prostitute, and this from the snake, and this from this. So, you know, to have that kind of view, of what 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 can I learn here? You know, like, a, like the dog, right? We was, we was meant to learn loyalty from the dog, you know, and yesterday I was walking around a pond near my house, and there, there there's a uh, a crane, you know, and he, and he stands so, so still so stiffly so you know how can i be so fixed in my intention to krishna so see now every how everything can can remind us and in what way it's it's, it's I, I i think when we become a little more advanced at least me because there may be so many people who are already there but i think we'll wake up every morning really enthusiastic to see in what ways is krishna going to appear and teach me today how is he going to come today? Where will I see him today? Where, 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 will I, where will I connect deep with him? And one final comment is when we talk about, like you said earlier, making people devotees, that's really arrogant. We should think, I mean, Krishna's already with this person. He has his relationship with Krishna. It's not like I'm going to come and give him a relationship. He has his relationship with Krishna. 
I'm just coming as his humble servant to help him remember, you know, to re remember. That's all I'm doing. It's not like I'm some transcendentalist who he's lost in darkness completely, you know, and, and there's no connection to God, and I'm going to give him God. God's already there. And if God wants, if Krishna wants, he's going to use me to help connect this person a little bit. If I do my part right, and if my part is angry or arrogant or this or that, I, I may not be as effective as I could be in helping him reconnect with Krishna. So I, I should take your leave. Thank you very much for your time and your wonderful uh, association. I look forward to having more discussions with you in future also. Please, Thank let's do that. Time. Thank you so much, Prabhu.